Welcome to week 12, where you will be learning about how people think about sustainable energy. This week you will be exploring the answers to these questions related to citizen action for a sustainable energy future. Why is it important to understand how people think about energy? Do people understand energy issues? Why is it difficult for people to, to make changes in their own lives that will help advance a sustainable energy future? What are effective and ineffective ways to get people to change their behavior related to energy? Why is supplying information not enough? How does energy behavior differ at the individual, organizational, and institutional levels? Which energy options do people prefer, and how do these preferences differ by geographic location, age, gender, ethnicity, race, and other demographic characteristics? How can lessons from human behavior research help inform effective energy actions in the future? As you've been learning about the various sustainability issues associated with current electricity, transportation, and heating options, hopefully you have started to form some ideas about how you would like to, to improve this system. However, any change is going to require public support at some level, whether it is voting for a specific energy policy, encouraging people to conserve energy, or adopt renewable home energy options, or encouraging them to accept a more sustainable option in their community. How people think about energy now and how effective we can be at getting them to think and act more sustainably about energy is crucial to achieving a more sustainable energy future. The first question we need to ask is do people understand energy issues? Do they understand what energy is, how they use it, where it comes from, the various technical, economic, environmental, and social implications of it, and what their options are? Think back to Unit 1 where you learned about the different forms of energy different ways of measuring it and converting units of energy. Now think about all the different options you have learned about and all of the different impacts associated with each option and each end use. Do you think people in general are aware and understand the depth of these issues? What has been your experience talking with people about energy? What did you understand or think you understood before taking this class? How has your knowledge changed? The first step in getting people to take action is getting them to understand. In a national online survey, 505 participants reported their perceptions of energy consumption and savings for a variety of household, transportation, and recycling activities. When asked for the most effective strategy they could implement to conserve energy, most participants mentioned curtailment, or turning off lights, driving less, etc rather than efficiency improvements, like installing more efficient light bulbs and appliances, in contrast to the recommendations of experts. For a sample of 15 activities, participants underestimated energy use and savings by a factor of 2.8 on average, with small overestimates for low energy activities and large underestimates for high energy activities. In other words, respondents had some serious misperceptions about what energy they were consuming. They were better at estimating energy use with smaller devices that they can see, like light bulbs, but seriously underestimated larger devices that are hard to see what they are doing, like dishwashers. In addition, participants correctly reported that transporting goods via airplanes consumes more energy than using other modes of transportation, and that the energy difference between trains and ships is small. However, they incorrectly reported that trucks consume approximately as much energy as trains and ships, even though trucks actually consume 10 times more energy per ton mile. Participants correctly reported that making a can or bottle from virgin aluminum or glass requires more energy than making the same container from recycled materials. However, they incorrectly reported that making a glass bottle requires less energy than making an aluminum can. In fact, the reverse is true. A glass bottle requires 1.4 times as much energy as an aluminum can when virgin materials are used, and 20 times as much energy when recycled materials are used, in part because glass is so heavy, making a recycled glass bottle actually require more energy than making a virgin aluminum can. Participants with a better understanding of numerical concepts had more accurate perceptions of energy consumption and savings, as did people with stronger pro-environmental attitudes. The serious deficiencies highlighted by these results suggest that well-designed efforts to improve the public's understandings of energy use and savings could pay large dividends. 
This has implications on the comparisons we make for people too. We need to compare to something they are familiar with, like a light bulb. Another national survey asked people questions to assess their basic knowledge of energy and how to read an electric bill. The results of this study indicate that people in general understand what renewable energy is, what efficiency means, how to read an electric bill, and do basic energy calculations. But they don't understand the difference between energy and power, that energy can't be created, where our energy comes from, how to save energy, or how to calculate energy savings from an electric bill. This understanding varies by demographics. People generally had higher scores if they had higher education, higher income, or older, or male, owned a house, and did not live in a city. Although people lack understanding about what energy is, where it comes from, and how to save and calculate savings, they generally agree that it is an important issue. And this agreement crosses political party lines, unlike issues such as health care, budget deficit, and the environment, which vary greatly across party lines. These concerns are echoed in a consumer survey published by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which shows that 80% of consumers care about the use of renewable energy, and consumers primarily associate renewable energy with environmental benefits. This study confirms what others have shown that people are not generally aware of renewable energy purchase options, which means that there is a lot of opportunity for renewable energy market growth if public awareness improves. Although you wouldn't know it from news media coverage, surveys show that most Americans agree that global warming is happening and is caused by human activities, and they are worried about it. However, they have misperceptions about whether scientists agree that global warming is happening, with only 41% of respondents to this survey thinking that scientists agree global warming is happening, when in fact 98% of scientists agree that it is happening. A group of researchers from George Mason University's Center for Climate Change Communication have used these survey results to divide Americans into six different representative groups based on their global warming beliefs. The six Americas range across a spectrum of concern and issue engagement with segments that accept and reject climate science at the ends of a continuum, and those that are less certain and less engaged in the middle. At one end of the, one end of the spectrum are the alarmed, who are very concerned about the issue and support aggressive action to reduce it. And at the other end are the dismissive, who do not believe it is a real problem and likely to believe it to be a hoax. Between these two extremes are four groups, the concerned, cautious, disengaged, and doubtful, with lower certainty and issue engagement. The segments are strongly associated with a range of characteristics, including climate and energy policy preferences, political ideology and party identification, cultural values, political efficacy, consumer and political behavior, and demographic characteristics such as age, gender, race, and ethnicity. People often talk about the need to change those who don't believe in global warming. But this work says you can't change them, so just don't piss them off. Instead, work on making the cautious and disengaged more aware and concerned. In order not to piss off the doubtful and dismissive, you have to be careful about how you frame the issues. This graph shows what types of arguments about global warming made different groups angry. Interestingly, arguments related to national security really pissed off the dismissive group, but health arguments weren't so bad. So if you want to convince people that sustainable energy is important for reducing climate change impacts, it is best to focus on how it improves public health rather than how it improves energy security. Okay, so although people lack understanding about what energy is, where it comes from, and how to save and calculate savings, they generally understand that it is an important issue. If they understand the importance of it, why is it so hard for them to change? Well, as mentioned before, they don't generally understand what the best options are, or even what options are available to them. But even if they did, knowledge on its own is not necessarily enough. Once upon a time, there was a model known as the information deficit model, or linear model of knowledge. This model told researchers that once an individual had knowledge about doing the right thing, they would adjust their behavior accordingly. And this model was beautiful and simple. But then the real world came crashing in, where there is actually a huge gap between what an individual may know and what he or, may sh or she may actually do. 
Not only that, but sometimes what we do may change what we think we know. Hence the phrase, mind the gap, which is actually a great article by Kalmus and Eigenman. From the perspective of trying to encourage environmentally responsible or sustainable behavior, ERB, there are many hypothesized ways to look at this relationship and the factors that fill the gap. Some factors include individual attitudes, ascription of responsibility, meaning do people feel a responsibility to do something about the knowledge they have. Structural factors, for example, is there available public transportation and other options. Positional factors like income, gender and age, personal values, world views, personal motivation, and societal norms. Ultimately, this means that even when people are provided the same information, they will process it very differently, yielding different levels of knowledge and different resulting behaviors. Some common reasons why people may not, react, may not act on compelling information include feelings of guilt, fear, and helplessness. For example, if you have pride in your country and your country runs on coal, you may want to ignore information that would make you question your country. Information that is too overwhelming may make someone reluctant to take action because the future is too scary to consider or because they don't feel like there is anything they can do. These last two reasons are somewhat easier to overcome by looking at effective and ineffective ways to trying to change behavior. All of these course materials include lessons and examples about effective and ineffective ways to get people to change their behavior related to energy including information on how energy behavior differs at the individual, organizational, and institutional levels. As you are reading these articles and watching these videos, pay attention to how the example messages target or ignore social norms. Social norms are basically the rules we follow in order to be part of a certain group. All of us, either voluntarily or by others in society, get put into various groups, and the social norms governing those groups tell us how to behave. We can turn to the breakfast club for one of the best examples of social norms, and maybe how to break them. Dear Mr. Vernon, we accept the fact that we had to sacrifice a whole Saturday in detention for whatever it was we did wrong. But we think you're crazy to make us write an essay telling you who we think we are. And you see us as you want to see us. In the simplest terms, the most convenient definitions. But what we found out is that each one of us is a brain, and an athlete, and a basket case, a princess, and a criminal. Does that answer your question? Sincerely yours, The Breakfast Club. Only two types of norms, descriptive and injunctive. Descriptive norms define what people commonly do. They motivate by providing evidence of what will likely be effective and adaptive behavior. An example of a descriptive norm is the absence of trash on the ground at a park. This sends a signal to visitors that people don't litter here. Injunctive norms, on the other hand, are the norms of what people should or should not do. They motivate by providing evidence of the social sanctions that will likely apply to the behavior. For example, watching someone else pick up litter and throw it away gives the message that people shouldn't litter here and they should clean up if they see litter on the ground. Unfortunately, communicators often pit the two kinds of norms against one another. For example, public messages about what people should not do often include the message that everyone is doing it. This has been a problem with messages against drunk driving, tax fraud, teen pregnancy, and smoking. While trying to tell people this is a big problem, we have to stop it, we end up telling them this is a big problem because so many people are doing it, which sends the message, everyone's doing it, why aren't you? As you watch these two videos in particular, try to identify not only what the message is supposed to be, but what the underlying messages are, especially in the context of descriptive versus injunctive norms. This article in the journal Energy Policy examines how preference for specific energy sources for large-scale electricity generation vary by geographic region and demographics and includes comparisons between groups of people living near and far from currently operating nuclear power plants. And these resources include information about how we can use lessons from human behavior research to help encourage more sustainable energy actions in the future, 
especially with an eye on implementing more effective energy policy, which will be the subject of next week's lesson. What policy options can lead us to a more sustainable energy future? And then we will conclude the course in week 14 with information about what you as an individual can do to take action toward a more sustainable energy future.